welcome to another episode, a week three edition of Home Visit with Tyler Siski and the Associates, and joined always by the Associates. And I guess we got to introduce them first. The man coming off a solid five and one week, hitting his money line pick and his lock, making the people in the Bluegrass State a lot of money. Eddie Grant, how we doing, brother? Doing great, man. And I just love that intro with the music. Just starts my Monday off just perfect. We were looking for a song, by the way, that was kind of like Sanford and Sons. And that's and we literally Googled it, and that's what came up. So <laughs> that was good stuff. And then introdu- introducing the man who also had a very solid week, a four and two week, even though it wasn't five and one. Eddie, I know you're going to let him know that. But had a very good four and two week, making the people – of Kansas and Colorado and Oklahoma and everywhere else, lots of money. DJ Elliott, DJ, how we doing, brother? I'm doing good. You know, I just uh, still trying to figure out how I can catch Eddie. Although I got a solid lead in week zero, you know, so I'm just trying to figure out how I can just keep it up. You know, week zero. Wow. Yeah, I, you know, if here's gonna be the here's gonna be the issue is if this come if this thing comes out, it'll all sort itself out. You know, it's kind of like everybody's you know jockeying for position right now, week two. It'll all sort itself out, okay, by the end of the, the end of the year. And it's kind of like in coaching, you know, you remember what you do in November. So, you know, mm. we got Ooh. we got a long season here, okay. Everybody, nobody needs to hit the panic button just yet. We got a long season to go. So, which we'll talk about that starting right now let's talk a little bit about were you guys up and i know i know it's past your bedtime eddie but were you up and did you watch (laughs) did you watch the end of the florida state jacksonville state game i did not (laughs) it was past my (laughs) bedtime so i did not so you guys are gonna have to fill me in i just saw the score and i had some texts from people in tallahassee and when I got the text, I knew what happened. Um, wow. Yeah, I, I, I did stay up and watch. Tell it. me what happened. So I stayed up and watched it. One, because Jacksonville State, that's my hometown. Okay, so right. Uh, I know a bunch of the coaches over there, obviously, and, and being in my hometown. And they had actually played Florida State last year. It was one of the few games they played in the fall last year um, and played them really close. Okay, so it was a close game a year ago. Um, and I think it was just a perfect storm, right? I think you had Florida State, who did – they lost to Notre Dame, okay, which that, that close loss doesn't look as impressive now considering what happened to Notre Dame this past mm-hmm. weekend. But regardless, they, they lost a close game. They felt like they were getting close. Uh, short week of prep, playing a, a FCS team that they had already beaten, emotional letdown where you had Jackson – and then Jacksonville State, on the other hand, had got really got embarrassed on that Wednesday – uh, by UAB and in-state school, and I think you just had a combination of, you know, hungriness, you know, looking past things, and they just they kept them around, okay? And it wasn't like they were – I mean, you never really felt like Florida State was in danger. It was one of those games where you never really felt like Florida State was in danger of losing the game. Uh, just wasn't going to be an impressive win um, until the last play of the game. And I was like – I woke everybody up in the house. I was watching it. Uh, I was in the bed, all right, and my wife was already asleep. Kids were asleep. And I literally <laughs> went, I was like, oh, oh my gosh. I, I couldn't believe what happened. So they they were, I don't know, minus 30 or whatever it was, and, you know, it doesn't have the, even the arm to get it there. And it's there's six seconds left to go in the game, and we're playing base defense. I, I, that part I didn't really – that way, if you had to go back, I mean, there were several malfunctions on this one play, but, you know, everybody says, oh, it doesn't come down to one play. Well, it did this time. You know, they, mm-hmm. they, they're they playing base, one safety, basically playing man free. Yep. And, oh, and gosh. he's running with him from, I mean, he's not impressed, but he's not in off either. I mean, he's, he's just kind of playing almost like catch technique. I don't even know, but like he was, I don't know, three, four yards playing trail with him. Catches it like the 10. But here's the here's the, the crazy. Just get him down. Just tackle him. And they both just run by him like it was – I don't know. I, I was really confused. It was like they just ran by the guy and never even attempted to tackle the guy. Like, just get him down. 
But my point is, it's like, and, and DJ, you're a defensive guy. I mean, there's six seconds left. And mm -hmm. I guess, you know, from a – and I, I was going to ask you this. The only thing I could think of was that they were trying to keep them from throwing something around the, you know, 50 to get a shot at the end zone. But wouldn't you be in some kind of two shell where you're keeping them off the sideline to keep them in bounds if you were going to do that? No doubt. You know, in the um, uh, – after the game presser um, – Norvell said that uh, they were concerned about them having a timeout and possibly getting into field goal range because they only had a three-point lead. But I think they were backed up too far to even within sec six seconds to, to, to get into field goal range and get a timeout and, and get that thing kicked, you know. And even with that, um, I would not have called man free. You know what I mean? I would have stayed in some type of – um, two shell, maybe a two Tampa look to make sure you had two or three safeties deep in case something got down. I actually, in that scenario, would have played Hail Mary defense, but I would have played Hail Mary defense a little bit different because they had no shot to get to the end zone. Okay, I would have right. played it in a way that where I'm trying to defend like a hook and ladder or something. But that's not what they decided to do. They decided, like you said, they decided to play base defense and they decided to play aggressive and they decided to you know, rush for and try to get after the quarterback, and it, and it really stung. And you made a good point, too. You know, the game of football um, is not won with yards. The game of football is won by winning situations. And situational football is critical in the way that we practice and in the way that we prepare and the way that we game plan. And this was a critical situation. You know, this is last play of the game, six seconds left, and then where is the ball? This is something that I'm sure Florida State has practiced uh, numerous times. And I, I know they're not happy with the way that uh, they execute it and possibly the way that they called it. And, and that's something to remember when you're watching a football game is does it come down to one play? It may, depending on the situation. And that situation has to be, has to be executed. And um, and that didn't happen in this game. And, man, did that bite them. Yeah. Uh, I was just like, I couldn't really believe what I was seeing. I mean, I was like, when he caught the ball, it wasn't like he caught the ball, you know, uncontested. The guy was all over him, just fall on top of him. And that was the other thing is I guess what I was getting at was like, even if you were going to – I think I too would – I think it was too much time. I mean, there was not enough time to get in field goal range, whether they completed a, a two route or, a, or Correct. what people – well, I used to call two route uh, – a read, a read route on the inside by, by two in the, in between the safeties in the middle, there's not enough time to get down the field to even get into field goal range. So, I, I too would have been in Hail Mary, just just freaking get the guy on the ground. I, I, I don't know. I agree. You know, now, here's the thing, too, and I, I, wanna, I don't want to be that guy, and I know we, from the coaching world, we're used to, we, 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 we don't like that guy. And I want to make sure the fans know this. All right, here it is. It's Monday morning. It is uh, – Approximately about, I don't know, what, 36 hours since all this took place. Um, and we've had 36 hours to think about it. And you got about uh, 8.3 seconds to, to make a decision. You know, you don't, you know, people, when you, you know, everybody talks about the Monday morning quarterback or even after the post game, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Well, because you've had 20 or 30 minutes to think about it. And I had about three seconds. Correct. Okay. Things happen. Things ha happen in what, you know, the, what they call the fog of war. I mean, things, I mean, there's a lot of things going on. Um, and y'all know because you've been there in the crowd and everything else, but everybody's like, oh, I can't believe you didn't do that. Well, when you have to make a split decision, I, I would like to put some of these uh, – because in the business world, in the real world, people don't have to do that. And I, I think that's the biggest difference in coaching. I wish that, that you could – there would be some kind of test or something. I wish you could put normal people in those situations because – you know, when, you, when you're making a business decision, you're saying, oh, let me sleep on it. Let me think about it. You don't have that kind of time calling plays. You, you right. literally have to go, go, go. And used to, you know, huddle, you had a little bit more time. Well, now with tempo and everything else, now defense coordinators don't have time. You've got to, like, you know, you've got you to gotta go, too. You've got to go as fast as you can go, too. So I, I think that's, uh, that's a big part I wish, I wish everybody could do. It's kind of like uh, being a anyway. pilot. Yeah. Like and and a I pilot. think – You know what I mean? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and I think DJ, you brought up a great point, and in, in that this game is so uh, about situational football, you know, and uh, you know, you practice that stuff all the time—that two-minute drill and 
and and where you're at and you give the offenses that that scenario all the time and the defenses that scenario all the time and that's where I think you know you have got to you know go through some of those scenarios during camp and you already have to have them in your mind how it's going to be played out you know and I'm like y'all I get I didn't even see it but just kind of visualizing where they were that is too far six seconds to try to get a field goal even if they got it to the 50 you know you put four safeties back there you know like dj said or sometime at tampa two where you got at least three or four back there and get him on the ground you know uh but i I just think you know offensively you know we talk about two minute we talk about four minute we talk about third down red zone uh, uh Time of possession, first down efficiencies, that's all situational football, and those are the things that you really got to be locked in about. And I agree when there's just 25 seconds left to make the decision, it's it's tough. Yeah. All right, moving on. I know, uh, well, let's, before we move on, like, and that, that's the other thing I do want to say, I guess, to all Florida State fans and everybody out there is, look, it, you know, what if I, you know, and I was going, I was going to bring, how about this? You know, there's only like, three or four uh, uh, winless teams in the Power Five, and they're one of them. Um, and yeah. I think from a Florida State fan's perspective, you're like, oh, no, here we go again. They've, they've kind of – ever since Jimbo left, it's been, you know, oh, you know, oh, you know, they're, they're searching, right? And they're going to hit the panic button, but it's a long season. And I just – and that's the – and good coaches, great coaches – get their teams to respond, okay? Because it's very easy for kids uh, to quit, kids to give up when it's time to adversity, especially in these days and times. I think kids are more susceptible to adversity, you know, giving up on adversity, but it's a long season. If they go 9-2, and two, nobody remembers that game. They may remember it later on, but, you know, what do you do from here on? It's still a long season. There's a lot of season to salvage. And, you know, I hate – and I don't think they're going down this, you know, going down this road by any stretch of the imagination, but – I can't stand – it drives me nuts early in the year with, like, really early games when teams don't get off to the start that you want them to get off to, that, you know, the fans start bickering and the, and the administration start listening to them and they go and dismiss a coach, you know, early in the season. I think that's ridiculous. Um, like, you look at uh, the one that sticks out in my mind. I know Eddie and DJ, y'all probably remember this one, was uh, when LSU played uh, Auburn. Okay, this is, uh, I don't know, three or four years ago. But – they were – whoever lost that game was getting fired. Like, I know for a fact on the Auburn side, because I know people inside – or knew people inside the building at that time, that if Auburn was going to lose – if Auburn had lost to LSU on Saturday, Gus was getting fired on Monday or Sunday. And then what happened – I don't know if you all remember that game, but Auburn uh, – or LSU wins the game, but they saw that on the last play of the game, but when the ball was snapped, there was the clock had hit zero, and so they reviewed it. And the play didn't snap, didn't count. So LSU lost. They it literally was that close. Okay, to where they snapped the ball, they scored, but the clock was on. Y'all remember that game a couple years yes. ago? Mm-hmm. But then Les yep. gets so LSU loses to Auburn, but Les gets fired on that next on whatever on Sunday Monday. He gets fired. Ed Orgeron takes over. What happens the rest of the year? Well, LSU ends up winning like nine or ten games. Auburn ends up, I think, going to the SEC championship game. Like, they they go all the way through and, like, win a bunch of games. But Auburn was getting ready to fire Gus Malzahn. This is the most ironic thing of all time. They were getting fired. I know for 100% fact, this is probably not out there in public. I know it's not. Because of the people inside the building that I had a personal relationship with, they were telling me this before the game. Like, yeah, like we already know. They've told us that if we lose this game, we're fired. And I was like, what? And they're like, yeah. And they win the game. But here's the kicker. So they were going to fire Gus Malzahn on Monday. You know what happened at the end of the year? They gave him an extension. So he went from being fired to getting against – yeah. Making $23 million. That's where where the hiring and firing of coaches, like, drives me insane. Like, it just – it's it's insane. Like, you're getting ready to fire a coach, but at the end of the year you get an extension. Let the coaches coach. If you're if you if they're under contract, because there's there's nothing good that can happen out of that. Everybody's like, oh well, we can get to the coaching market earlier. Bull crap! Don't tell me, don't don't give me that, because we came into a situation here at Ole Miss in 2012, 
12, I guess, when I, we came with Freeze for Arkansas State, that they had let, you know, Houston go earlier, uh, earlier, you know, in the season. Well, your kids, you have no, what, there's no, you know, accountability for the kids. They're out, you know, we got kids smoking dope and everything else. You got, you got a bad culture problem when you dismiss a coach because what do the kids care? Some coach is going to tell you what to do. You're going to tell the kids are going to tell you, kiss my crack. You're not even going to be here in three weeks. <laughs> you know, so don't do if you if, if we got ads out there, don't ever do that. That's that's bad. That's bad ball for the programs. So, all right, that's my soapbox. Let me get off that. All right, let's let's move on to who I'm going to ask you guys a question. DJ, we'll start with you. Are the Iowa Hawkeyes for real or what? I believe they are. I think that uh, Iowa, you know, has always been a team that's hovered around eight or nine wins, and uh, and Coach Prince has been doing that for over 20 years. And I think that this is the best team that he's had. He's got a bunch of guys back, again, reaping the rewards of the COVID super seniors. Oh, man, they're a physical team. You know, they, they play football in a way that they always put themselves in position to win every game. They never are out of games. And they look dominant in the first two weeks. And I think they're back. I do. I think there's something that you're going to have to, you're going to, have to deal with over there in the Big Ten. Eddie, what, what, do you, what do you think? You know, when I saw that question, uh, they are probably, if not the most balanced team uh, right now. Uh, that's what I saw. You know, they're doing it everywhere. Uh, and they're just playing as a team. And, and uh, I, I really like their energy. Uh, they're disciplined. Uh, and like DJ said, they've got a lot of leadership, it looks like, on that team. Um, and uh, I think they're a team to be reckoned with for sure. Yeah, the, the, thing, that, the thing that was impressive to me is, and when we talked about it, you know, in our preseason deal with Iowa, you know, when you see these development teams, like, and I was like the definition of a development team, and people are like, what do you mean? Well, like, look at Iowa's recruiting rankings. And this is why I always say, like, this is where, you know, as coaches and somebody that's inside the recruiting deal, recruiting rankings are, you know, again, five-star guys aren't hard to identify. I mean, my, my wife can. She can do it. She knew, like I always tell people all the time, when she saw Robert Comdici walk into the room for the first time, she was like, I bet he's good at football. I was like, yes, he is. <laughs> I mean, guy's six foot five, 306 pounds, and had a six pack. He's pretty good and runs a legit four or five. Guy's, guy's good. Okay. But they evaluate very well. They get people to believe in their culture and they develop. Well, with this COVID seniors getting an extra year, you know, that helps those guys. I mean, they're only going to get better. And I think, and just to be be fair, I think that's why you're seeing a lot of these FCS teams compete and do really well against FBS teams this year is because of the retention and, you know, having those guys back, you know, because now they have a little bit more depth, and that's usually the, the difference between an FBS and an FCS game. It's not the, usually the first 11. It's, the, it's players, you know, 30 through 60. And, you know, I think that's a, a big deal with those guys. But, man, they're, I think they're the real deal. I, I think if I had to uh, rank the Big Ten, I, I don't know if they're not my favorite for the Big Ten right now. Do you guys disagree with that? Uh, do not. I'm, I'm, I, I, I love their position right now. And uh, I think uh, for all the reasons that you all just talked about, that uh, they're going to they're gonna be tough to beat. That was a tough deal what they just went in and did. And they've done it seven years in a row. That's what's the most impressive deal to me. I mean, that is hard to do uh, in a rivalry game. Um, you know, you had uh, a game day there. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was freaking stout. Yeah, I, I think you're looking. You know, uh, they they don't have to play Ohio State in regular season. I just what I was just looking at. They have to play Penn State. You know, that's that's really their. Um, they got to play Penn State, and, you know, Penn State's got a long road to hoe, and, and Penn State actually has to play Indiana the week before they play uh, Iowa. But I was in the driver's seat, and I, I, I can't wait to uh, – I'd like to see the Ohio State um, – Ohio State-Iowa matchup. I don't know if we're going to see it or not. That's going to be the interesting part. But we'll, we'll, we, we will we'll, <laughs> we will see. I, th I think that side's uh, – 
Ohio State's got some questions to answer too, which we'll get to here. In the, just actually, the next think, thing on the list. Go ahead, TJ. I think Iowa is playing as good as anybody in the Big Ten, and I agree with you guys. They may be in the driver's seat. I think Penn State is playing pretty good football too, and that's going to be yes, they are. that's going to be the matchup. I think that's that's really after week two, that's going to determine which one of those teams is for real in the Big Ten. All right, go moving on. That's our next one. Okay, Ohio State. Where do the, where does Ohio State stand with you guys? I, I think that was. Uh, I guess we'll start with you, uh, DJ, since we just were on it. But where does Ohio State stand with you right now? Ohio State is uh, struggling on defense. Ohio State, I think, uh, has really got to get some things shored up on defense before they can be considered not only a national championship contender but a Big Ten uh, champion. So they they need to really. You know, get those issues fixed. Um, I know that C.J. Stroud is is getting better, and, and I think he played well in the second half of that game against Oregon. But they've really they've really got to get uh, their their problems on defense hammered out because they're not playing championship caliber defense right now. Agree. I think we saw that in the Minnesota game. They just you know they just shoved it right down their throat for most you know when they wanted to, um, and, and kept themselves in the game. Eddie, what what do you think? Yeah, the run defense, that's concerning after a couple of weeks, uh, which you, that you don't see people running the ball like that against an Ohio State defense. And then, you know, I, I think, and DJ, you might agree with this, being your defensive guy, you know, he, just a lot of man free in some situations where you, 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 you got to change it up a little bit and cloud some stuff on third down. And there was just too many easy conversions for me um, that uh, it was a little disheartening, you know. Uh, so I think they will. I, I do. Um, I think I think Coach Day will get them going, and uh, they'll fix some of those things. And uh, you know, like you said, it's a long season. Uh, by far, they're not out of it, and uh, I think they'll be okay. Yeah, yeah you know, would, like you talked about, Eddie. A lot of these things they go back, and you know, as coaches, and you look at your self scout, and and you look at your deficiencies, and you say, okay, I got to make this change, and then. All of a sudden, things you know make a 180, right? And uh, and now you're playing good defense. And what people don't realize is is that uh, they made the adjustments that they needed to make, and and you know, and, and it made a difference. And um, I won't be surprised if 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 Ohio State doesn't go back and do that. But right now, it's hard to say that they're a chance of championship caliber team because they're just not playing very good defense. Yeah, Agree. And, I, and then going back to what Eddie says, I don't care who you are, I don't care who you play. If you line up and play, you know, man free, and that's what you're going to play, I don't care how talented your guys are. On the other side, schematically, if you give a, if you give a guy one look or, or one uh, one coverage or whatever, you're going to go, you, you're going to get picked apart. There's enough scheme and, and there's too much out there right now with you know the spread offenses, how to account for the quarterback in the run game, everything that everything that goes on with that. I think you're going to see. Um, you know them struggle. They got to do something. They got to. Well, think about up. LSU. You guys. Think, think about LSU, and Mississippi State last yeah. year. Yeah. Remember that? That's exactly they went, what happened. They went one free the yep. whole game, <clears throat> and they 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 crushed them. And then what happened the next four weeks to Mississippi State? Everybody rushed three and dropped eight, and they could not yep. move the ball for for anything. I think I think the old days of we're just better than you and we're just going to line up and play that that doesn't exist anymore. You know, there's just too many ways that that you can that you can out scheme people that you can that you can put your players in a good position to make plays. You you have to be able to to mix it up and you have to be able um, to confuse the quarterback a little bit in order to be successful. I don't I don't care who you're playing. Yeah, we talked about this a lot. I think earlier this summer but you know always you know especially when I was in a group of five and we'd go play all these money games and all that stuff I mean you would go and and you know this is not uncommon you know eight nine ten years ago is where you would go play a team you were Arkansas State you go play Texas A&M or you'd go play uh, Illinois or Virginia Tech or whatever they're just gonna line up and say hey we beat you on signing day so we're gonna line up we're gonna play man free or I remember Tennessee they were gonna play cover two every snap you know back in the day and and this is what you're getting because we're just better than you are. 
And I, I think two things. I think one is I think the you know the talent gap has definitely shrunk. Okay, there's a lot of really good players out there, and especially I, I think this is not this is not going to be something that gets wider. I think you know everybody's like, oh, with well, the transfer portal. Well, the thing with the transfer portal is the real high quality high school players, their level is dropping because everybody's going portal heavy. That means that better high that group of five schools are going to be able to get better talented high school kids than they've normally been able to get. And so I think you're just going to see this gap, you know, shrink even more. Um, but you can't line up the days of line, like you said, the days of just lining up and saying we beat you on signing day, you, you're going to have to um, change that, you know, just at the end of the day. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with play. Don't get it wrong. There's nothing wrong with playing man free. Just let it be a mix up. <laughs> right. You know, don't. Don't don't just line up and play man free every snap, or line up and play cover two every snap, or read two, whatever we call these days. So, uh, moving on with that, let me take my sip of my my tea that I like so much. All right. All that being said, everybody's talking about Ohio State, Ohio State, Ohio State, but has Oregon not only put themselves, but really it's not really the whole Pac-12, but Oregon, in my opinion, and y'all correct me if I'm wrong, is not not only giving themselves a, a legitimate shot at the playoff or UCLA. Whoever wins that game has put themselves the Pac-12 on the doorstep of the playoff for the first time in a long time. I think they got the Pac-12 has. I mean, you got UCLA just drubs LSU, and then you got Oregon that goes on the road into the, into Columbus, which really nobody thought, and, and really dominating fashion beats Ohio State. Where's the Pac-12 at right now? Yeah, that hasn't happened in a long time. I can't remember the last time that any of us talked about a Pac-12 team, let let alone two. And uh, I think the those two wins that you just talked about, UCLA, that was as impressive as a victory. I, I really was impressed with UCLA and, and what they did on defense. Uh, you know, offensively, they're going to be good with Chep. But I thought defensively, they just they, they played fast. And you hadn't seen that from a UCLA team. And uh, uh, with Oregon doing what they did uh, at, at Ohio State, I think you do have uh, a couple teams there that have a chance to get into the playoff. And let me just give kudos to the administrators at Oregon and, uh, and UCLA because Mario's coming into what, year three or four? What is he, Tyler, right now? Did he get three? Three. He left the 16th, whatever year that Willie left to go to Florida State. How many years was he? Whatever year yeah, that so was. four. I think he it's year out. four then. Yeah, because this is Willie's second year at uh, FAU, right? Yeah. So so Mario's yeah. Mario's coming into um, to year four at Oregon. Chip's in his fourth or is he? He's Chip. Third? I think he's in his fourth. No, he's in his fourth year too. Yeah. I think they're both in their yeah they're both in their fourth year. So my point is is that. We know as college coaches that it takes time to build a program. Here, there's two guys there that are recruiting, they're developing, they're putting their schemes in, they're developing their culture. They they have their players now. They have they have um, everything that they want in place for their program in year four, and they're flourishing. You know, you know, we've just seen time and time again where coaches aren't given that time. And I think it's a testament to continuity, and I think it's a testament to development over there in the Pac-12 right now. And I believe that these two teams have played good enough, and kudos to them, too, for scheduling two tough non-conference games for them to be able to showcase what, time they, what type of team they are and put themselves on the national scene. The whole Pac-12, really, if you think about it. I mean, Washington schedules Michigan. Granted, Washington's not playing good football, and they didn't win, okay? Colorado has Texas A&M on the schedule. UCLA, like we talked about, plays LSU. Oregon's got Ohio State. Um, USC plays Notre Dame every year. I mean, the Pac-12 is at least putting themselves in position to show that they're a national championship contender. And you got two teams right now that are sitting here in week three that we're talking about because of that. And I think that both these teams have played well enough, and uh, don't be surprised if one of them doesn't get in. That development part yep. is huge. Um, you know, you, you remember Auburn and Petrino Gate, right? We're, we're, we're getting ready. We're going into our fifth season, okay? And, uh, and we've got a good team. And uh, we get done with the Alabama game, and, and we get a call the next morning, and, and we're fired. And then the governor steps in, 
and says, no, we're not going to do it that way. Do you know what happened after that? We went on, yeah, I, we, we went on to win 55 games in the next five years. We went on to beat Alabama seven out of 10 years. We went on to beat Alabama six in a row, a couple SEC championships, and somebody else would have been coaching those guys. And, uh, you know, you got to develop. And, and kudos to, to Mitch Barnhart at, at Kentucky. Look, look, at, look at Kentucky to, to be able to develop some of these guys. And he's the, one of the winningest coaches in the history of Kentucky football. And he's, he's going on year 10 or 11. Or, and, and you know what? There's been ups and downs. But he's let him, he's let him recruit. He's let him develop. And uh, I just think, uh, you know, Mitch and, and what Mark has done, uh, I think that's where you want to be. You know, you look at Iowa. And I think it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a travesty in our sport. It happens because of the money, because of the fans, because of the TV, because of all those other things. Uh, it's just a shame. I said this. I think this. I probably said this. Raquel would have to uh, correct me on this one because I fact checked me on this one. But I said it. I don't know if you guys were on or before we, you guys started doing this with us. But the problem in my eyes is it happened about. You know, that this change happened about 15 or 20 years ago to where, you know, people who are athletic directors used to be coaches, okay? That's, that's how you became an athletic director 20 years ago. I mean, all, every, all the ADs were former coaches or sometimes back in the day were, were the coach, right? The people making the decisions were in athletics. Well, this, this transition happened about 50, really as I was getting in the business 15 or 20 years ago, that ADs now became fundraisers, okay? Well, when you have a coach or a guy that has a coaching background that's an athletic director, that's in charge of hiring and firing coaches, they care about one thing, and that one thing is winning. But also as a coach, you are programmed to tune out the outside noise. You don't listen to the outside noise. You focus on what you have to do to get better. You don't listen to everything that goes on in the outside world, okay? Now, when you look at uh, – now this, this transition has occurred to where now all the ADs are now fundraisers or come from the fundraising world. So now you're, they are trained to listen to boosters and fans and make the fan experience happy and, and, and do those things. And so when the, when the, when the you know, everybody starts chirping, they're tuned to listen. And I think that affects decision making. Okay. And like we've talked about a ton, I, I think that's the biggest difference in why Coaching changes happen so frequently, but you know it, it is what it is. And don't get me wrong; there are times that, that changes need to be made. But I think we're just overall we're just we're just too quick. So I agree. I'm gonna pop. Oh, you still with me, DJ? I lost you on video, so I know it says you're. No, you're I'm here, here man. Oh, you know that's okay. why I look better when the video disappears. So <laughs> I was doing it just to improve my looks. But no, I, I'm with you guys 100%. I mean, and, and Eddie, you talked about Kentucky, and I was with them for the first four years, and we went two and 10, we went five and seven, we went five and seven, and then in year four, we went seven and five. And that was the year that you were there, or year four, which I would like to give you kudos. You made a huge difference. But, um, you know, how many ADs after two and 10, five and seven, five and seven would have just cut them loose? You know what I'm saying? But we went into year four and went seven five, and I don't know that they've had a losing season since. Yeah, not gonna have one this year either. Nope, nope. So, all right. Speaking, we we mentioned a little bit about the SEC. Let's let's talk about the the big game in the SEC this past week. Uh, thoughts on the Arkansas Razorbacks? I got it. But I'm gonna start this one off. I came this close, and I told I told Eddie this. I came this close to making the Arkansas game my money line pick because I've had to go into Fayetteville, okay? And I don't know, I wish maybe somebody in Arkansas is listening to this. If I was the AD at Arkansas, okay, I know they change ADs a lot there. If I was the AD at Arkansas or anybody involved in any decision making in Arkansas, I'm telling you this from a coach's perspective that's had to go to both places, never play another game in Little Rock. Play every single game in Fayetteville. I think my record against Arkansas, I'm undefeated. Okay, with blow, with like taking bad teams in there and winning or whatever it is. I don't think I've ever lost to Arkansas in Little Rock. 
Now, I was at Alabama when we were pretty good, by the way, and we went into Fayetteville to play, and they were not very good at all, and we had to scrum out of there with like a 14-13 win. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a hard place to play. I was actually talking to somebody the other day. I went back and looked at it. I was trying to remember. Every time Ole Miss goes into Fayetteville, they get their teeth kicked in. They get their teeth kicked in. When you go to Little Rock, we beat them here uh, a couple years ago. Um, and then when I was with Freeze, that was the year uh, Petrino had the neck brace thing. You remember all that happened? Mm -hmm. So, But they, they were good. I mean, they, he had a really good team. We went in there with like 50-something scholarship players and beat them. It was like, and it was in Little Rock. But don't, and then Hugh, a couple years later, goes back with a good football team. You know, he had everything turned around and got his teeth kicked in in Fayetteville, you know, by 30 something points. Playing in Fayetteville is a difficult, difficult, difficult trip. It's very difficult on everybody. I don't know what it is, but play them all there. So, I agree. We went in there at Auburn with Ronnie Brown, Carnell Williams, and and we got our tail kicked. Um, it, 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 it's hard. It's a hard place to travel to, uh, get to. Uh, and uh, I thought they played just great team football. Barry Odom had a heck of a plan. And uh, I think offensively they got off to a great start. And uh, once they did that, you know, they could never catch up. You know, they were playing behind the chains the whole night. And uh, I thought that quarterback from Arkansas uh, – Managed the game well, and uh, I tell you, it was a fun game to watch. Yeah. Well, and this is an old rivalry. Some of you younger people might not realize this, but when Arkansas was in the Southwest Conference, I mean, this was a huge rivalry between Texas and Arkansas. And I think uh, I read that this was uh, the loudest that they believed, and maybe even the most fans that they'd had at Arkansas in a long time. You know what I mean? They said that this game had been sold out for quite a while, and they had been gearing up for this game for quite a while. And that goes back to the fact that this is a long-existing rivalry that that people may not realize. I mean, in the Southwest Conference, I mean, these two teams used to battle. And I think that all those fans that remember that rivalry showed up for this game and made that a incredibly tough environment to play in. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep, that's a great, I mean, freaking great point. I mean, it's just, a, and it's not even like, but this is the weird part for me. It's not about the fans, and, and I don't know. It, to me, I mean, any SEC stadium is going to have rowdy fans except for Vanderbilt. It, it's it's not, I don't know, it's just the trip, man. I don't know what it is. It's like, it, it's. It you, is. It's hard. You, it's hard to get, even from your hotel to, I mean, from the airport. It It's just everything about it. Yeah, I don't even know. It's, it's hard to describe. Like, I, it's just you're out in the middle of nowhere. You, it's, a, it's you know, tough to get there. And then, like, like when you fly to the airport, it's like you're only, oh, we're only, you know, eight miles from the from the uh, hotel. It takes you an hour and a half. I mean, it's just like you're in the neighborhood in buses. And, I mean, I don't know. It's just it's a tough trip, man. And every single team that I've ever gone there with, we've either got our teeth kicked in or we struggle when we should have been dominating. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm – I love it, and this is another one. Let's talk about while we're on, while we're giving the uh, administrations our opinion on coaching hires today. Sam Pittman to the public was not a popular hire. Okay, they wanted everybody else and all that stuff. Great hire, man. What a what a ball coach, and and we know that because we we're in the business. Like, good for you, man. Go hire the ball coach. That's the first. That was one of the very few hires. Because now, like we were talking about with ADs, they want to make the fans happy and all that stuff, right? I, I'm, I'm honestly convinced. You can't you can't convince me anymore right now. I'm firmly convinced that 99.9% .9 of the ADs out there would rather win the press conference, okay, when they sign a guy, when they when they get a new coach, then they even they don't even think about winning football games or building a program. Sure, and that lasts 48 hours. Yeah, you know? and, and 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 it just it makes no sense. And I agree with you. It was a great hire. The players love him. The coaches love him. I know some guys on that staff, and they love working for him. And and, and that's 90% of the battle. Yeah. And uh, it just – I agree. That, that's such a great point about, you know, ADs wanting to win the press conference. Get the right guy for your situation. That 24 hours, 48 hours is going to be over. 
Then the guy's got to go recruit. Then the guy's got to start developing. Then the guy's got to hire a great staff. And, the, and that's what Sam did. And, and kudos to, to them. And uh, it's awesome to see him having um, success because he is a great human being as well as a great coach. Well, you know, Sam Pittman was there as the O-line coach under uh, Brett Bielema. And so people in the administration knew him. They knew what type of coach he was. They knew what type of person he was. So they had an idea of what they were getting. It wasn't that they, you know, did this search and, and, and found Sam Pittman through some, you know, search firm. It was the fact that they knew him because he had been there. And that actually happens more often than you realize. Look at Shane Beamer getting the job at South Carolina. Shane Beamer got that job at South Carolina because he was at South Carolina before, and they knew him. They knew what type of person he was. They knew what type of coach he was, and he impressed people while he was there. And the same with Sam Pittman. He impressed that administration while he was working there, and I believe that's a big reason why he got that job. Right, but for the same reasons that Tyler said, though, a lot of the ADs, they can't deal with the fans and, and who they want. and. Um, you know, and it's hard. You got to have some cojones, and you've got to stick with your guns and say, "Okay, this is the, the right fit." We knew that, and some of them don't do that. But I agree with you, Deej. Yep. Yeah, I think, I, I'm, I think I'm, we're all on the same page, and we think they made the right decision. And all I guess all I'm saying is Sam Pittman is in this position because of the people he impressed while he worked at Arkansas. Yep. And I think you know, and and here's the the, the thing with. Uh, South Carolina, that's, you know, if you look back at South Carolina, let's, you brought Beamer up. Let's look at South Carolina for a second. Do you, do you know who the AD of South Carolina is? He's the old, he was a baseball coach, right? That was, that was really good baseball coach. So what do you know, what is, what does he, oh, yeah. he gave Will Muschamp many, 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 I mean, he, he didn't just go, he could have fired him a long time ago, but he gave him opportunity. And now he hired this guy. I hope he does with Beamer too. You got to give these guys a chance to build the program. And I think with, you know, they've done it. They they will. I think South Carolina will end up. Beamer will do a good job there. Um, but you got to understand it is what it is. You're in there with a, you know, South Carolina. You're in there with a beast. And you know, Steve Spurrier is a pretty good ball coach. I think we'd all agree with that. You know, it, it you know, it's getting them get to the top of the mountain is very difficult there. It, it's going to take time. So. Yeah, they've had some good no in there too. So, all right, let's let's move on. After two weeks, before we get to this week's picks, after two weeks, what I'm going to do is we'll go over uh, everybody's top five. Okay, well, how do you see it? Your top five, Eddie. Since you're the, since you went five and one last week, let's just start with you. Since you 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 seem to be the expert right now, so we're going to start with you. All right, your top five. Who do you have at number one? Number one, I have Alabama, the Crimson Tide, at okay. number one. And uh, I, I think that makes total sense. Number two, until, um, you know, I, I think because they had such a, a big win uh, against Clemson, and I think their their defense is maybe the best in the country, is Georgia. I think that's safe. At number three, at number three, I have Iowa. Like it. I have Iowa at number like three, it. Oregon at number four. And Oklahoma at number five. I like it. That would be my top five after week three. All right, DJ, go ahead. At number one, I have Alabama. Okay, I don't think anybody's arguing that. And I think they're head and shoulders above everybody else right now because they're playing good in all phases of the game. Number two, Georgia. Like you said, that defense is incredible. I think, uh, you know, they're in position to compete with Alabama because of that defense. And so I have to put them at two. And, and um, you know, there's, there's a, a chance that these guys could, could win the SEC and, and, and get into the championship. And I think that um, they're as talented as anybody out there. And I think that this is their year to really compete for that. At number three, I have Oklahoma. I think that after week two, you still have to consider a little bit of last season in in uh in your rankings because there's just not enough evidence to determine how good you are and granted they did not play good defense in week one against Tulane but they still have the players they still have 
uh, the schemes. They still have the coaches, and they executed well at the end of the season last year. And so they're still on my mind on how they finished last year, and, and I've got them at three. At four, I have Oregon. Um, Oregon has played a big-time opponent this year and, um, and, and played well. They controlled that game. I mean, if we talk about Oregon and you watch that football game, there was no doubt in my mind that Oregon was going to win that game after the first two series. They just had complete control of that game. Ohio State uh, had a push at the end to try to get back in it, but Oregon dominated Ohio State. It wasn't like this was a dogfight that was a seven-point game. This was a, a game that Oregon led the whole game, and Ohio State made a push to get close at the end. And so I think that uh, Oregon is playing really good football right now. And another thing, too, is Fresno State's a good team. You know, they caught a lot of flack for playing Fresno State yep. tight. I mean, Fresno State is a good football team. And um, and Oregon is – You know who is, they, you know who they got this week, don't you? You know who Fresno takes on this week, don't you? We'll I do. We'll get some answers on that this week. Yeah, I do. Is, UCLA Bruins. UCLA? UCLA Bruins, yep. So yeah. there's another good matchup. And then at five, I have Texas A&M. Uh, Texas A&M uh, lost their quarterback in the second series of the game against Colorado. Um, did not play the way that they wanted to play on offense. But, you know, I know Jimbo, and, you know, I, he's going to get that thing right. And, um, you know, who, whoever's going to be quarterback this week is, is, is going to be better because if, it's, if they go back with the starter, then it's, it's the guy that they believed who was going to be the guy from – from the beginning, or if they go back with um, uh, the second team guy, I can't think of his name right now off the top of my head. But anyway, he got a whole whole game under his belt of experience too. So I think that they'll play better football, and I think that they have the talent to compete uh, for a championship this year. They're extremely, extremely talented. Uh, their uh, tight end is incredible. I mean, their defensive line is really good. Their secondary is really good. Um, I just think that um, you know they had a close game, but I, I, I don't I don't not believe in what they can do. Yeah, my number one, no surprise, Alabama. I think they're the most complete team right now after two weeks. Um, pretty easy there. Number two, just like everybody else, is Georgia. Again, it was funny we were talking about this the other day. DJ is uh, how pissed off is uh, Kirby right now? It looks like they gave up seven points, but it was actually a pick six. They didn't. They still haven't get off a defensive touchdown yet. It was a pick right. six to end the game. So we were just talking about that yesterday, because yeah. that's on their stats. Yeah. yeah, we were just talking about that. Their, or last last. Their, uh, yeah, so it's on their stats, but they still have not given up a defensive touchdown. I don't think they're going to give up a defensive touchdown this week either, and I don't think they're going to give up a defensive touchdown the next week because they have South Carolina and Vandy back to back. I know. Like I know. Holy smokes! I mean, it's 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 scary, man. Like you, I, you gotta hope somebody falls down or something. I think that's the only chance you got. South Carolina or or Vandy's gonna have to hope somebody falls down or if they play with nine or something. I don't know, but it's they gonna have to. They're good. All right, my third team. I think I'm going with Eddie on this one. My third team is Iowa. Iowa, man, they compete. I like them. They're deep. They're senior laden. Um, and again, it reminds me kind of like a. I don't know. It's kind of hard to describe, but it's almost like watching like an old Alabama team. They just just dominate you, and then you end up losing the game, but not by a lot. Like it's you know, it's like before Alabama got good on offense, they they just they control the game. I, I like I like them. My fourth team is the Oregon Ducks. Okay, I'm going with the Oregon Ducks. I think. Uh, that was impressive what they did Saturday because it wasn't just – I mean, that's a hard place to go and play too. And they went in there and, like mm -hmm. you said, dominated from the jump Oof. without their two best defensive players. You're right. We, we didn't even talk about that. No, you're right. Um, they got the first pick in the draft sitting over on the sideline. So – Right. They, it wasn't like they went in there and were – and it, somebody else they, – they were, you know, on the – everybody's like, oh, well, Thibodeau didn't play. He's not going to play. And their starting backers not playing. They had two – they're two best players on defense, and they controlled the game. Uh, so I'm right. going with them on four. I'm really looking at – I almost did a hyphen. I really do think – I think the winner, as long as they, there's no slip-ups, okay, because you know how it can get out there. There can be a slip-up, you know, with USC. Or they play it. As long as they – the winner of the UCLA-Oregon game, I believe, deserves to be in the playoff. And then the last one, which, which could create a fun uh, discussion later on, 
Uh, but the last one for me is o OU. And the only reason it's OU is OU has all the talent in the world. Um, and they just, there's, for me, every, it's, this is like the a rinse and repeat. Where, when's the game? There's always a game that they lose, whether it be Kansas State, Iowa State. They lose somebody they're not supposed to lose to every single year. And when is that game going to be? Until they, you know, if they run the table, I'll hush and they, they can go get it. But there's always that one game. And that usually is what costs them a playoff opportunity because they lose to a team that's not very good. So that's right. why I'm always putting them five. I'm just waiting on the, the shoe to drop on them. So It was almost too lame. Uh, that team was almost too lame. Yes, we'll we'll talk yeah. about that game here. Yeah, it was. We'll, we'll talk about that game here shortly. Because uh, no. moving on into this week's games and our picks and discussions, we have to start with a champ. All right, just to review, Eddie was five and one last week. Now you're nine and three overall. Like you're making people money. Like you're you're up six <clears> units. <throat> like people loving you in Kentucky, huh? Besides week zero, he's nine and three. Besides, yeah, week they zero. are. Um, yeah, we you know. Yeah, week zero, nobody counted because when we talked about it on this, nobody even used those picks. I would love to count it, too, count. because I had a good so, week zero you know, as well. Zero. Well, it counted yeah, it, it counted on the win-loss record of the teams. Can, and, and it counted in certain people's pocketbooks, too. So yeah. Yes, those it are, did. Yes. Sure. But not but on – For this beautiful – Hey, we're just getting everybody warm. We're good. Hey, beautiful just, scenario hey, that we have you here. You always remember – what you do in November. In November. So, hey, long. Or the first I'm just going to let you guys know. <laughs> yeah. Week, I'm just going to let. Either yeah, way. I, I want to let However you guys look know. At week three, like this is where I, I've watched enough ball now. I've seen everybody play. Let's go. I'm ready to go. So, I felt really good. Like, by the way, I felt so good about my picks last week that if I knew what was going to happen, I still would have picked the way I picked. I, I'm very, like, Buffalo – was in the red zone 47 times. I need one score to cover. Okay, I lost. TCU, I don't know. Did you, any of you guys watch that game? I know there was a bunch of other games on. I was watching it because I picked them. TCU, like, dominated the game. They could have scored 700 points if they wanted to. And, and just very frustrated on, on those guys. And then, now, I would say this. The one that I was that I missed and never had a chance and was very impressed was Mississippi State. And DJ, me and you both missed this one. Mississippi State controlled that game against NC State. I know. That really yeah. surprised me. Really surprised, surprised me. me, but I was like, I mean, defensively they look good. So they did. But it really goes back to if you, what, what's going on with those ACC teams. You know, if you you're starting to you're starting to see a trend, um, conference wise. So which is going to lead me to, to some picks this week. So I'm ready to go. All right, Eddie, start us off with your first pick. Who we got? I'm going to ride the Iowa Hawkeyes uh, as Kent okay. State comes in, and they are minus 22, and that will be my first pick of the week. I'm a believer. Hey, you I'm know what? I used to, and I'll tell you what. I used to pick with you about these big spreads, but you're hitting them, so nobody can nobody can complain. Yeah, you know, same thing. The one I missed last week. You know, I had one where somebody scored, and that's the problem with those big ones. Somebody scored with a minute and six left. You know, and and yeah, you got bad. You got bad beaded for a perfect weekend. Yeah, and and then that, uh, you know, that the the only one I lost last week, this last week, was the Minnesota game that. You know, the first two drives, they dominate like I thought they would. I thought they would run the ball against Ball State, and they get up 14-3, to three and I'm going, okay, here we go. And then they start throwing it, and they start – and I don't get it. I just do not get it. But, anyway, that was the one I lost. But I'm going to go with the Hawkeyes, minus 22, Kent State. All right, DJ, number two, who you got? All right, I'm taking um, Texas – Plus 25 over Rice. I think they're going to bounce back. That game's back in Austin. And I think that uh, they're going to be fired up and they're going to try to prove something. Yeah, I actually agree with you. Not, not, not one of my picks, but I agree with you on that one. My first pick, and uh, DJ, you may – I'm, I'm taking the Oklahoma Sooners. Mm. Minus 22 – against Nebraska. I'm going with a big spread. Now, why am I going with a big spread after I just talked about OU being inconsistent? You don't poke the bear, okay? They're good. They're talented. Like, I think I'm being dead serious here. This is the only reason I would take this line. 
I think Lincoln Riley is trying is going to try to make a point again. It's all this stuff that happened last year, trying to get out of the game and all the old time robbery. There's there's some bad blood there. I think Lincoln Riley may try to score 85 points if he can. Like I don't ever see him cutting off the juice, and I just don't think. I mean, 22 points. I I, I really do think this could be like a 60. 63 to 21 game or something crazy like that. I, I think they're going to try to, and I don't even, the over wasn't that bad, but, you know, OU's questions on defense, but I, I think they're pissed off and they're going to try to make a point in this it's game. A good, so I'm taking a good OU pick. Mi- minus 22. Good pick. Yeah, that is a good pick. All right. DJ, do you have that one too? I have that one, and I also have Iowa too. So I actually oh, have, I, I, I've got, uh, I already have two common picks with you guys. I got Oklahoma at uh, 22, and I got Iowa at 22. I think that they're both going to beat the spread there. And I agree with you about Oklahoma. Um, I mean, I don't know if you guys saw that score last week, but he tried to score 100 last week on poor Western Carolina. You know what I mean? It was <laughs> 76 to 0 against those guys. And so I, I, I definitely think against even a more high-profile opponent, he's going to do the same thing. Yeah. And then with all the bad blood, like there, there's there's bad blood here. Yes, and, definitely. And, and don't like like what I was trying to tell you guys, A and M and Alabama. Don't don't piss the guy off. Just just let's just let him play. Right. Let him yeah. play. Right. Yeah. Right. So, all right, Eddie, go, go, knock us out. Pick two. Pick two. Kind of the same thing that you guys have been talking about here. I think there's going to be a, a very pissed off Ohio State team, and they're minus twenty five against Tulsa. And uh, I'm not sure you can make that line uh, big enough. Um, so I, I just I just think that uh, that score will be high, and I think they'll play with some energy on defense, and I think Tulsa's getting ready to run into a buzzsaw. The only thing I would say about that, Eddie, is some people don't realize this, but Tulsa was one of the top defenses in the country last year. Yeah. And they've actually, put, they've actually played – really good defense this year as well they just haven't been able to they haven't been able to score but i don't disagree with you but i just want to point out that that tulsa is really good on defense for those of you that don't know that they were i think uh, you know top 10 last year and have, have really done a good job this year too oklahoma state beat them i think what 20 what was it 28 23 last week i guess and um Anyway. They will rush the ball for over 200 yards against this defense. And if you rush the ball for over 200, you have a chance to win the game. And uh, I think they'll uh, I think they'll hammer them. No, I don't like disagree that. with you. I don't disagree with you. All right. Uh, since you've already got three out there, I'll go ahead and get my second one. We'll try to catch up here, okay? So okay. You, so you won't be sitting there holding my second pick, okay, is I'm going UVA, Virginia, on the road at North Carolina, plus eight and a half. I am, like, they're good. You know, a lot of people not talk about Virginia. They're pretty good, yeah. you know. They're pretty they good. They had a big team. win. They had a big win. Big, yeah, they did. They, they win, crushed Illinois. Big win. I think they get a, they're good on defense. I think they're good on offense. And I think, you know, I think with North Carolina, I think their issues are coming up front, okay? And it's not in the skill positions. It's not a quarterback, obviously. Uh, but it's on up front, really. And they're playing decent on defense. I know that was an issue coming into the season. But up front offensively, they're struggling a little bit. I think, for, I think that's where, in my opinion, when, that, when I'm looking at lines and just so – I guess the people listening. When I'm looking at lines, a lot of, when I, especially now moving forward, this is what I what I do is I look if I can find a matchup that I know somebody's going to dominate up front, regardless of what who's a quarterback and skill positions, and they're an underdog, I'll take them every time because if you if you can win the line of scrimmage battle, you're going to keep the game close, regardless of what everybody else thinks. Correct. Um, and wh- what else you got? You're going to keep the game close, and that's a two score line, and so. You know, if it was like two and a half, three and a half, I would probably wouldn't touch it. But if, since it's two scores, it's eight and a half. I'm taking, I'm taking Virginia all day long on that one. Not saying that, that North Carolina won't win, but I'm taking Virginia on that one. Yep. Yeah, I almost took that one. I saw that line too, and and, and noticed that. Yep. 
All right, uh, Eddie, pick three. Pick three will be my lock uh, of, of the week, and it's going to be Texas Tech minus 21, and FIU is going to fly to Lubbock, Texas, and it is not a very fun place to fly to. It's difficult. Uh, it will be, it will be rough on those kids from South Florida, and I think uh, uh, it'll be really tough for them to keep that within 21 points. So that's you were my lock. Texas Tech for a little bit, wasn't you? Nope, nope, never. You didn't go to Texas journey. Tech. No, had to go play there at, when I was at the University of Miami, and uh, it wasn't very fun. Now we were really good then, but it still. I, I just, I, I think this is a uh, lock game of the week. Lock, I like it. I do need to go back and tell, and so Raquel and the people know, my lock of the week is OU Nebraska, just so everybody knows. That's my, I forgot to say that. That's my lock for the week. I start off with my lock, so I'm going OU Nebraska. All right, uh, go ahead, DJ. Who, who's your next pick? Well, let me just say this. My lock is, um, is Rice, Texas. I think Texas is going to beat Rice by more than 25. Um, and next pick for me is my money line pick. And okay. that is Arizona State is favored by two over BYU. And I think BYU is going to win this game. Okay. And, um, uh, and obviously they're going to cover because Arizona State's favored by two. But, man, they're playing good football right now. And they, they were playing good football last year. You know what I mean? And it's just continued and it's rolling. And I think that they're, they're going to be tough to deal with. This game is at BYU. Um, it was a great atmosphere. If you watch that Utah game late the other night, <clears throat> I just think that um, that they're going to get this game. I am not picking that game, but I love that pick. Yeah, I'm. 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 I'm uh, I, I looked at that one very like I am. There may be my my own money maybe on that one. I, I like that one a lot. I like that one a lot. Yeah, you got this is a this is a good uh, like I'm listening to y'all and there's going to be a battle. I, th I think right now, DJ, I think you're undefeated. I, I do. I really believe that. I well, think you're, I think these picks are really really good. You know what? I think if everybody just bet every game that we all said, then they'd come out on top because I I feel good about a lot of your guys' picks too. And I don't mean to kumbaya all you guys, <laughs> but I think there's some no. picks this week that uh, I think are going to beat the spread. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, if they would just – so if people would – regardless of what happens, if people just pick – even in my crappy record that I've had, if they just went all across the board and picked all of our games, what last week they'd have been 9, 10, 11, 12. They'd have been 12 and 4 plus 8 right. units. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good gig. That's what I'm plus saying. Two, plus money lines. That was pretty yes. good. That's pretty good big. Yep. All right, here we go. My third pick. My third pick. I'm going. I'm, I'm going to piss some people off with this pick, Eddie. I'm going Penn State minus Ooh. six and a half against Auburn. Mm. Ooh. It is a yeah. I'm going to piss some people off on this one. It is a night game in Happy Valley, on the road, wide out. There'll be juice. I watched first time. I made the comment, I won't say who I made the comment to, but a very good friend of mine that has uh, close Auburn connections. Um, watched Auburn, you know, uh, I, uh, I played at Auburn, went to school there, the whole deal. Very, very um, disappointing is not the word. I, I, offensive line-wise, they're atrocious. Auburn's struggling offensive line-wise. They played Alabama State. They played Akron, and they're not playing consistent enough. I, I don't think on offense. Now the, the Tank Bigsby, he'll have to carry the ball for Auburn to win. He'll have to carry the ball 45 times. He's he is a legit dude. He can play, but can they block for him? Uh, I, I don't I don't know if they're going to be able to. Uh, do enough up front, like we talked about. That's the thing I'm looking at, is the matchup up front. Now, Auburn on defense, they're good. Uh, but offensive-wise, offensive, offensive -wise, they've been scoring 60 points, and that's what everybody's talking about. And I think that's what's even kept this spread where it's at. I think, I think 
Penn State beats them pretty good at home. Hmm. So I was very uh, offense line wise, they got a long way to go. So, all right, Eddie, got you back. What you got? Uh, pick three or pick four for you? Pick four for me will be Stanford minus eleven at Vandy. Uh, I thought that was a very impressive win. You know, kind of going back, and unfortunately, a couple of weeks ago, you know, DJ had Stanford, Kansas State, or somebody yeah. like that, and I, I thought that was a lock, mm -hmm. in my opinion, too. But they just switched it around. They played like you thought they were going to play right. the next week, and I think that I think they will keep it going. I do not think Vandy is a very good football team uh, right now, and um, I, I think that's just a. a I'm really excited about is that. Is this the SAT Bowl? <laughs> it is the SAT. Yes, right, they're going to have a the spelling bee before the game. Yeah, this is the SAT Bowl. We have the ACT Bowl also, but I don't think anybody's picking it. But you also have Northwestern playing Duke this week. So, uh, ah, uh, the oh, academic yeah. weekend. Yes, yeah, academic weekend. I mean, if yep. we had Harvard and Princeton playing, it'd be a perfect weekend, right? Right. So. Yes. Hey, let me just say this, Tyler. You gave me all kinds of crap last week for picking Vandy to beat Colorado State, and that was a W for me. Oh, I didn't. And you went off. You went off for about fifteen minutes after Eddie got off the phone about how crazy I was for even touching that game. And I mean, I came out on top of that thing, and I just want to be humble like Eddie and just say that. You know what I mean? Just hey, hey, I'll, <laughs> hey I didn't give you. I, I do. I, I do. I want to go on record and say I didn't give you crap about picking Vandy. I gave you crap about picking the game, period. Like, I don't even know. Like, I could have picked the game, too, just flip a coin and see if it went heads or tails. Who knows how that game was going to go? I mean, that was, that's just like, you know. Yeah. I, I think I made some good points, and, I mean, I came out on top. That's all I want to say. I mean, we yeah. brought up Vandy. Hey. You know, we, 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 don't, we don't always go back and talk about each game individually. And, yeah, this was one to, to not only give Vandy some props, but definitely give me a lot of props. So, yeah, I just didn't know which – I didn't know, like, I don't, I don't even know what inspired you to do that one. That was, that was a good one. But, yeah, that's it. That is what it is. Uh, All right, pick four. Who you, or you, got, you got four and a four, I guess, is your, your fifth pick. Who you got there, DJ? So, this was a tough one for me. Um, but I went with Mississippi State um, minus two um, – over Memphis. I think Mississippi State's going to beat Memphis more than two points. And that was hard because I do like those guys at Memphis, and I think they play good football. But last week kind of, uh, you know, changed my thought process on Mississippi State. They did. They ran some different schemes, man. They had some eight-man drop beaters in there. They, you know what I mean, they, they played really good defense. And um, I think that they're going to beat Memphis by more than two points. I'm not touching this game. I looked at it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm. It's at Memphis. I know. And you know, it's minus two for a reason. It scares the heck ooh, out of me. Scared. Tough place to play. Memphis score some points too. They're they're scoring points. Um, man, I don't know. It's gonna be. I'm I'm kind of. I'm, I'm gonna watch the game. I'm interested to see what happens. Um, but yeah, that's that's my man Mac, Mac, uh, Mike Mac at Mike McIntyre at Memphis. Oh yeah. Charles Clark. I worked for him at Colorado. I think he's an excellent coach, and I think those guys have a great staff. But I saw some things in that Mississippi State NC State game I wasn't anticipating, and uh, after yeah. watching that game is what, uh, which was what uh, changed my idea about this. Yeah, and I'll say this: you know, Norvell left that. They they're do they they have they do a great job in recruiting, um, and the other and. The thing, the other reason I didn't, you know, just exactly what you were talking about a couple of weeks ago. I remember who were, what game we were talking about, but DJ, but you know, a lot of these kids that are at Memphis wanted to go to Mississippi State and got shunned for whatever reason, right? And so there's that, like, it's the same way when Ole Miss plays Memphis. Like, they either beat Ole Miss or it's closer than it's supposed to be. I mean, it's never, you know, there's a legit chip on the shoulder when it comes to Memphis playing uh, SEC teams. SEC so teams. I, Especially the Mississippi. Remember they used to give – they used to beat Tennessee. I mean, it was like it was uh, – when Tennessee was rolling. I mean, it's just always that thing. So, I, yeah, I just stayed away from that one uh, for that reason. But I don't – I mean, I can't – I wouldn't 
that's when I'd be having to flip a coin. I don't know. I don't feel great either way because. But once you saw what Mississippi State, my first did, thought was with you, yeah. DJ. When I saw yeah. Mississippi State, they they my looked good. My first thought was so, with you. Yeah. All right, my yeah. my uh, fourth pick. I'm going to catch up here. My fourth pick. Which I'm a little surprised that neither one of you got this one. I'm taking Marshall minus nine versus East Carolina. Uh, I watched that South Carolina East Carolina game. Marshall's good. Um, like I don't see it with East Carolina. I don't see it. I think Marshall beats them pretty good at home. So going Marshall minus. I like it. All right, pick number five for you, Eddie. Who we got? Uh, I'm gonna stay with those Hogs uh, against Georgia Southern uh, minus 23 and a half. I think the Hogs will cover that one this week in Fayetteville. I think one of the things that is hard for a head coach to do after a big win is to next week is to, you know, get the players ready to go. You know, everybody's going to be patting them on the back, telling them how great they are. And I think Sam will be able to do that. And uh, uh, it might start slow, but I think at the end, this one will be big. Yeah, I will. I don't. What's Time for them to make a statement. The Time for them to make a statement. Does anybody know off the top of your head? I mean, that's not something no. you would keep up. Let me look it up real quick. So, the over-under is 52 and a half. That's probably high. Now, I'm not picking it, but that's probably high because Georgia Southern, you know, they're going to they're gonna run, you know, basically triple option out of the gun. So, they're going to keep the ball on the ground. I think Arkansas keeps it on the ground. I think clock runs on that one. So, it'll be interesting to see on that one. So, that's a lot of, that's a lot of points in that game. Uh, yes, right, it DJ, is. I think this is your last pick. One, two, three, four. It's your last pick, DJ. And this has got to be your money line pick, right? No, you already got your money line pick with BYU. Um, All right. Uh, this pick is, pick is the Alabama Crimson Tide will beat Florida by more than 15 and 15.5 points, in my opinion. I think, yep, I think that the um, they're good, man. And, and, and you know Nick. I mean, he's going to have them ready to play. And, you know, Florida's it's been a little, you know, spotty to me. I haven't really seen a dominant Florida team this year. And, you know, you know what's crazy to me is another game that was um, intrigued me was, was uh, you know, Miami. Miami this week is favored again. But to me, that just shows you how dominant – Alabama is the fact that Vegas was going to give Miami six and a half um, points to win this week. And I thought about that game, you know what I mean? But then I started thinking in the back of my mind, well, maybe Alabama's just that good. And so, and Appalachia state is that good. And that's yep. the thing too, is in my opinion, Alabama's good. And Appalachia I did hit state that are, game last week, just so y'all know. You did. Yes, you did. Okay. Yes, you Alabama's did. good and Appalachian state's good. And Miami's favored by six and a half points this week to win. You know what I'm saying? And so that just told me that uh, Alabama is really that good. And I haven't seen Florida be dominant this year. And I'm going with Alabama. Do not disagree with you there. Um, I had I got several. I had a bunch of games <laughs> written down that I like. I like I like a lot of games this week. I will go on record saying that. I had, it was hard for me to get down to six. I like a lot of – I was trying to, <laughs> I was trying to pick the six safest ones. Uh, but that was one I had written down, I think. The scary part about Alabama is it's week three, okay, which means that's another week they're getting better. And here's the, here's the one thing that uh, I don't know if I've ever talked about this on the podcast or not, but the hardest week, like when you're playing Mercer at Alabama, Nick makes it feel like you're playing the New England Patriots. It's the worst week. It's fourth in inches every single second. It's nonstop. Okay, and then when it comes to big games, he kind of like he's got this way of building everybody up, and it's like no no big deal. There will be no anxiety on the Alabama sideline about playing in the swamp. Like you can take your home field advantage and big games and just throw that. I mean, they might as well be playing in front of nobody on the practice field. Like it's it's crazy how that happens. I think you got an inexperience. You know it. it when I say inexperience, a lot of, you know, there's not a, I wouldn't call Emory Jones or whoever an experienced quarterback. You know, they've played in the games, but it's a lot different than playing five snaps and playing all of them. Dude, that's, I'm with, I'm with you 100%. That's a great pick. Yep. 
I like That's that a good a pick. Lot. Good pick. Yep, I think they're going to. All uh, right, that's so good pick. my, what's this, my fifth pick. I'll go ahead. I was going to save this one for last, but since my man DJ just men mentioned it, <laughs> yeah. my money line pick this week is the Michigan State Spartans over the Miami Hurricanes. Mm -hmm. I got Hurricanes. a chance. I've watched Michigan State play. I've watched Miami play. I'm just going to let you know. And by the way, I mean, I don't know what the under is on this one, too. I might double up on this one. Um, let's see what the under is on this bad boy. Michigan State can run the football. Just so y'all know, they can run the football. And everybody's like, well, you know, this and that. They played this team. Let, let, me, let me hit you with this right here. All right. So Michigan State, it's already dropped, but it's dropping by the second. Uh, I'm going to take them at six and a half, or excuse me, money line. I don't care. Money line is at plus 180 right now. All right, but let's go back and look at Michigan State last week. Okay, now everybody's like, well, they didn't play anybody. Or they, you know, the win didn't look impressive, right? Everybody's like, they played Youngstown State. They won 42-14. That's what you're supposed to do, right? But listen to this right here, okay? Passing, just passing, they were 20 of 28 for 323 and four touchdowns. That's 11.5 yards an attempt. Every time they dropped back, it was a first down. But more impressive to me is the rushing stats. 38 for 272, 7.2 yards an attempt. And then the guy ran for like three bills in week one, right? I mean, they, they can run the football. What does Miami struggle doing? Stopping the run. Okay. I think, I think this has uh, got Michigan. Michigan State's got a ball club. And, they're, and they're, nobody's talking about them. But when you can run the football and can control the line of scrimmage, they're playing well on defense. Dude, I, I love Michigan State all day long in this game. This is my favorite money line pick of the year so far. So, I'm loading up on Michigan State. What do you think about that? You like the uh, you like that game, DJ? I do. I almost picked that game. I mean, that was it was going to be that one, or it was going to be uh, the Memphis Mississippi State game. You know, those two. It was that, those were my finals there on which one was going to be my uh, my sixth pick in this in this round i uh i just stayed away from it because i don't think we really know how good miami is because they've played two really good opponents that's the only thing i agree with you i believe michigan state has a ball club i think michigan state has played really good football in the first two weeks they struggled last year you know they really didn't have a very good team last year but but they played really good football in the first two weeks the only thing that held me back from it was was that uh, I, I don't think we know who Miami is yet because of who they've played. That was the only thing. But that was that was going to be, like I said, that was going to be, it was either going to be that one or it was going to be Mississippi State, uh, uh, Memphis for me. I love Mel Tucker as a ball coach. I do. Um, you know, he get, you know, he, he's, he was one and done at Colorado, but I like what he's doing. And, the thing I liked about when they're playing Northwestern or who they're playing week one is how they were coaching, like how he 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 reminds is crazy and he's a great guy, but the way he coaches, like he's taken so much of you know, he was at Georgia for a long time and all that stuff, but he's taken so much where he coaches to the whistle. They were killing people and he just you can see him coaching the culture about finish. They were they were winning the game, but he was the way he was coaching them with thirty six seconds to go, you know, like it was the game was online when it wasn't. I just I love that stuff. So, all right, Eddie, let's roll with your last pick of the week. Who do you got? Which will be my money line pick, and it will be an interesting pick, I think, for you guys. Um, about Indiana at home. Like it. Um, I I don't think they've played to their potential. I I just I'm a big believer in in Coach Allen. And uh, I think it'll be a big day uh, uh, at Indiana this weekend. That's my money line pick. Yeah, interesting. I, I do not, di I do not disagree with you on that one either. I can't. I'm not going to fight you on that one either. I, you know how much I love my Hoosiers, but you know I know that. I know what I guess the level of dis disappointment was after the Iowa game. Okay, but I was a good football team as we've discussed. Um, they, you know, they played Idaho last week, which nothing but. You know, they've been – they want this game. 
you know, and, and they, they this yeah. is a game that this isn't something that hey, week three we got Cincinnati. They've known about this game for for a while, so you know, I, I think this one's uh, going to be a big game. I think they got them at home. Um, and look, Tom and Cincinnati's is, tough. I mean, it it, it was. It, I'm kind of going out on a limb here, but I'm, I'm I, I just really believe that uh, it, it's going to be tough with that that crowd. Uh, they know they need this game. Uh, I think that uh, them playing Iowa, uh, they learned a lot, and uh, so we'll see. I don't know. It's kind of jumping out on the edge here. I don't. I don't. I don't disagree with that. I like that. All right. I like your money line pick. I like yours too, Deej. Well, yeah, I, I think there's some good games this week that you can earn, earn some money. All right, since Deej, we already got your last one. Your your six. My last pick. I'm surprised nobody picked this one. My last pick, Colorado minus one, minus one. So it's basically a pick them at home versus Minnesota. I I freaking, I I love I love. See, Eddie doesn't like this pick. I love this pick. All right. I don't know because Minnesota screwed me. So I, I just don't know what team's gonna show up and because uh, I I'm like look. I don't care what they did on defense against A and M to match up against that talent. I don't think they're going to be able. To, I don't think they're going to be able to line up and run the ball against Colorado at Colorado. I, I think they. I think Colorado's a, a good team. I do. I don't think they're a great team, but I think they're a good team. I think they got them at home. I think that's another tough place to play. DJ, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think it's them coming into Boulder. I like it. I'm taking basically Colorado to win is what it is. So I I think it's a good pick and and. You're right in the fact that when you go play Colorado at home and, and A&M played them at mile high, but still, the elevation is a factor. I mean, that's a factor on people. You know what I mean? You get tired quick. I mean, I, I was watching that game, and, and uh, the A&M players looked tired, man. They did look tired. and it's, They just can't catch their breath. And I think the same thing's going to happen with Minnesota. And I was at Colorado three years ago, so – I was a part of recruiting most of those kids on defense, and they are talented. I mean, their defensive line, uh, Terrence Lang, who's one of their defensive ends, we beat USC on him to get him, and the only reason was he had some academic work that he still had to do, and I don't know that USC was – he was committed to USC, and I don't know that USC was, was willing to wait on him like we were, and, and, and so we took him, and he started there for four years, and he's a senior now, and he's 6'6", 290 pounds, runs like a deer. I mean, he's an NFL defensive lineman. And uh, Jalen Sammy is a nose guard that we took there um, from Colorado. He's 6'3", 350, um, and, and he plays nose guard, and, and he dominated in that game. You know, they, they have some really good defensive talent, and I know it firsthand because I was a part of uh, recruiting it. And those guys have developed, and they're all juniors and seniors now. Nate Landman's one of the top linebackers in the nation. Uh, we signed him out of California, and and uh, they're going to be tough. The only thing I would say, Tyler, is I was not impressed with them on offense. But granted, they were playing Texas A and M, and Texas A and M is very talented. You know, it was a very talented defense too. So it'd be interesting. Yeah. Maybe top three in the country. Yes. So yeah, I mean, they're yeah, and I, I just I'm not. I don't know. I, I'm not sold. Like I, I'm not sold on Minnesota. I'm not. And maybe they, maybe they proved me long, wrong this week. But I'm not. I'm not sold on them at all. So, uh, and then them being on the road. Um, I think it's a good we'll pick. Thank you. I think it's a good pick. Yeah. It's one that it's one of the, the quarterback in Minnesota is not playing very well, at all. Right. And then they he, lost their. He ain't, he ain't got those dudes. He ain't got those dudes he was throwing to a couple years ago. And uh, he just looked out of sync and, bad. And he don't have the running back either. You know, their best running back. Yeah, I agree. So that was, you know, and look, when you, I don't care who's playing quarterback at A&M. If you, you hold A&M to 10 points, and it was really, it was 7-3 for a long time to the very end. I mean, you got, you know, it was, you know, which, which you know, Texas A&M, we know there's a whole different story. It's like, but this is Texas A&M every year. Everybody's, everybody wants to throw in a towel on Texas A&M right now, too. This isn't unusual. They're, they It takes them a minute to get heated up, so we'll go there. All right, the last game I want to talk about, that was our picks. So, go make you some money. I like these picks, man. I, I might, I, y'all might, y'all, it's a good, good week. So, 
before we move on, we'll finish up with this because I know none of us picked it. Uh, but we do have a lot of uh, people here in Mississippi listening. We talked a little bit about Mississippi State and Memphis. But here in Oxford, Mississippi on Saturday night, there's an interesting matchup. And I don't think it was as interesting of a matchup probably three weeks ago as it, as it has been since. And that is Tulane coming in to Oxford to take on the Rebels. Um, the line is at 14, I believe. It's been moving a lot this morning. Let's see where we got it at today, right now. As of, I mean, like it's literally moved a point and a half in the last, uh, in the last, since we kicked it off here this morning. So right now. What is it now? It's back up. Okay, so we went back up to, it's at 14 and a half. It's been going from 14 and a half to 13 and a half and back and forth. Um, so the line is two lane minus 14 and a half. Okay, and which is, I came very close. If I bet this game, which it's moving up to, damn it. If I was to bet this game, I would bet the over at 73. Okay. Um, let's talk about it a little bit. Did you guys get a chance to watch any of the Ole Miss game uh, Saturday night? No. Okay, no. so they played Austin P. They should win. That's what they do. You know, we probably got a little stat chasing a little bit on offense, started forcing little balls a little bit, trying to get some TD passes and all that. But defensively, I – I mean, we had 20, gave up 24 points in the second half against Louisville. Austin P really, uh, they kind of, I mean, they, the reason that they didn't kill them is because they didn't have the weapons to do it. But schematically, there were some holes they found. Tulane's got some players now, and Tulane's got a good quarterback. I think Tulane scores points on a lot of them this week. I just don't think they score enough. I don't think Ole Miss is any danger of losing the game. Maybe I'm wrong there, but. Uh, I think this is one of those classic shootouts from last year. I think this is going to be like watching last year's Ole Miss team. What do you What do you think about that, Eddie? Well, after what I saw Tulane, uh, it was a scary pick for me. I looked at it, and, and um, I, if I were to go with my gut, I would have gone with Tulane and taken the points. Um, just because, and, and I do like the over pick on that, but uh, I just, you know, we got. We got to see. We got. I'm still. The jury's out. Still on Ole Miss, and I think Durkin's done a good job. But I, you know, that's just too many points. You know, uh, and I think that uh, Tulane's quarterback. I agree with you. Uh, I think he's pretty darn good with his weapons. So uh, I would take the 14 in that game and 14 and a half, and uh, I'd, I'd I'd probably let that bump. And I could see it being one of those back and forth deals. And you know, right at the end, 14 points is a lot. You know, and Tulane's going to be jacked up, and um, for a lot of reasons, some of those kids don't think, you know, well, they they passed me up, and uh, so it, it was tough for me to to, to go on that one. See, so I'd go the other way. I'd go the other way. I would have picked um, Ole Miss. I think Ole Miss is going to win this game by more than fourteen. I like your idea though, Tyler, of taking the over because I do think it's going to be a shootout. I think. Tulane is a very talented group of five team, and I think they have a good scheme. I think they have a good quarterback. But I don't think that they're going to be able to to stay within 14 with Ole Miss at home. Um, you know, the Oklahoma game was unique. Game one, it was supposed to be in New Orleans, and all of a sudden now it's in Norman. And I, I, don't, I don't think, think they've gone back. I think they're still in Birmingham, by the way. I think they, oh, I don't think they've gone back to New Orleans. No, I'm saying like I don't think I think Tulane's been staying and practicing in Birmingham. I don't think they've been home yet. They actually played this past week at Legion Field. Right, and I think that uh, I think that's going to I think that's going to weigh into some of the um, the way this game is played too. I, I just think that going into Ole Miss, okay, and um, playing there in Oxford and and having to defend that offense, I don't think that they're going to be able to stay within 14. I, I, I do agree with you guys. They have a good offense. They got a good scheme. They got a good quarterback. And I and I like the idea of taking the over. But I think this game is going to be won by more than 14 points. Who who's a better defense, Oklahoma or or? Uh, I think Ole Oklahoma is probably a better defense or more proven um, from last year, not necessarily from this year. But I think week one was so unique. That's the point I was trying to make. One, they didn't know what Tulane was going to do. They didn't know really, 
you know, where Tulane was offensively. They were supposed to be going to New Orleans and all of a sudden, hey, now we're playing the game at home. I think the OU kids probably had a little bit of, well, we're really going to kill them now on their mind. I think Ole Miss is going to come into this game going, hey, guys, we, we better have our, our jaw set. I think that uh, Tulane has, has got a good football team and we're going to have to be ready to play. I think those, those elements all yeah. took into consideration of why that game was close against Oklahoma uh, as close as it was. I, I, I think they, like I said, I think they got a good quarterback. I think they have a good offense. I don't think that they're going to stay within 14 of Ole Miss in Oxford. And I'll say this, okay, and this is kind of where I'm at, with, especially the over, okay. And I and and I would I'm, I'm putting my own, like I'm almost talking myself into making this one of my six bet and taking one off. This is where I'm at with the over, okay. It's 72 points, okay. So whatever, let's say it's whatever they're saying the final score, whatever. Louisville played Ole Miss, right, the first game, and they got shut out. They shut Louisville out in the first half, correct? We remember all that happened. Okay, and then, but what people don't remember is Louisville came back, and I, I somebody can fact check me, I don't care, but I, they pretty much scored, Louisville scored on every possession in the second half. Okay, and so they ended up scoring 24 points in the second half. Okay, Louisville is not an offensive juggernaut that we all thought they were going, they thought they were going to be better. They played this little team up there in Eddie's neck of the wood called Eastern Kentucky. How good is Eastern Kentucky, Eddie? Ah, uh, you know, they're, <laughs> okay. they ain't very good yet. They're gonna. I know this much. He's gonna do a great job there, especially if they give him time. But I don't think they're a well, juggernaut yet. Louisville managed to score thirty on the defensive juggernaut called Eastern Kentucky. Okay, one week after playing Ole Miss. All right. I just. I. I think that. You know. This defense hasn't hasn't been tested yet. I know everybody's looking at that first half shutout. Like, look, if they shut people out in the first half, they win every game because they're gonna score points now. And just like I was telling you, I don't think that. I think that when you turn around and you look at Ole Miss, I don't think Tulane's stopping them either. That's why I'm, I'm going with the over. I, I just think, man, I see Tulane scoring 35 points. I may see Ole Miss scoring 56. That's why I'm scared. I'm scared of that 14 too. I think Ole Miss is going to outscore them. But, I mean, that's 72 points is not going to be enough in this game. So, I, I would – I'm putting my – I'm not. it's not one of my six. I want to make it my seventh one. But um, that's definitely one the more I look at it. It's a good pick. I like that over. That over is a good pick. All right, so this this next week, uh, DJ, me and you got to got to close some games down. Like Eddie's got like a, you know, he's got like a what two game lead on you. Um, he's coming back on. He's got like a four game lead on me. Only problem is, is I like his picks. So we got to figure out <laughs> something between now and now in November to uh, close the gap a little bit. See, my problem is I like y'all's picks. Like, I'm going down there, and I'm sitting there going, man, mm -hmm. this is some good stuff. I think somebody should take the three of our picks this week, and, and I think they could make them some money. I think they could. I, I really uh, I really don't see many of them. I, did, I didn't really disagree with – I don't think I disagreed with anybody's pick. The only one – like, I don't want to touch – I'm the ones that scare me, but the ones that scare me usually pay like – the like my man DJ, he picks the scary picks. I don't want to touch. They always hit. So I should just the ones I don't like, ones that scare me that DJ picks. I should just pick them and go and go with my <laughs> life like to last week. But guys, I want to appreciate you coming and joining us this week. And guys, remember if you like what you're hearing, subscribe and leave us our three star review because you know we love it so much. And until next time, take care.